This is Hamble Oil Terminal here yeah, and tankers dock on the end there and unload oil into these big tanks. This is part of the reason why I wouldn't eat seafood from this beach because it is an industrial environment here and although there is so there's something down there beneath the sand there's a clam or something underneath the sand there making these little dimples but I wouldn't eat them from here because they tend to accumulate pollutants and yeah that's a that's an oyster that's alive and well but again probably not safe to eat This is interesting. Down here we just got water running out of the gravel as the tide has receded. And it's formed these little meanders, just like kind of like river systems in complete miniature. You can see like there's a, almost like a little river delta there, but in tiny miniature. Sausage hand for scale. Yeah, so there's a better example. You can see why, well, you can see kind of how it's meandered and cut its own little channel, and you can see traces of earlier cut channels as the water just trickled down the beach here. So here you can see water still actually running out of the gravel here. There might be, oh there is an outfall over there, so that's just from water from land drainage. Green triangle means nothing particularly nasty. That's interesting, that's a piece of granite there. That doesn't belong here. This is the jetty for the oil terminal. And you get quite heavy barnacle build up on this. The so great big thick encrustations of barnacles. And every now and again, big chunks of it flake off and die. And I did actually find some on this beach a while back. And it's almost like coral. It's, it's not so pretty as coral, but it's got a kind of interesting porous texture. I did actually make a little pendant out of it. I'll link to the video. Let's see if we can find a piece of this, uh, what I call barnacle coral. Or barnacle coral. All of the rocks on this beach are derived from sponges and invertebrates that were fossilised millions of years ago. So every single one of these rocks is made from silica that came from the skeletons of sponges and other marine invertebrates. And sometimes you can find the kind of traces of fossil sponges. So there's a kind of hollow rock, it's not a geode. That's actually probably a fossil of an echinoderm or sponge or something like that. There's a piece of, yeah, a piece of bark and stuff there that's fallen off or something. And so what we're looking at there is the in, can you be quiet? What we're looking at there is the inside of barnacles. This is the field where I planted thousands and thousands of acorns year before last. And I did visit here in the spring of last year. I managed to verify that a few of those had sprouted and were doing okay. However, I'm not feeling enormously hopeful for their long-term survival because the development is happening here. Now as far as I understand it this bit of land here is going to be left untouched but who knows because all sorts of things are happening down here that weren't supposed to be happening. I'll take you through that I think because it's quite interesting. Right come on Eva, come on this way. 
Come on. So first off, there's a there's a track been cut through here because there's a water pipe under here, a drainage pipe, and so that's just access to it, and that goes all the way to the road over there. So there's that bit of construction there, probably not too obtrusive. Let's go a bit further on and see what the, the work is all about. So this is one of the things that's happening here, which is a bypass. This is bypassing the village of Botley where I live, and this is being built at the moment. And we have needed a bypass for a long time. I suppose I can't really complain because it is, you know, this is progress and ultimately the land where my house now stands was once forest or field, and so <laughs> It would be hypocritical of me to say nothing should ever be built. But, yeah. So over there there's a school. That school is called Deer Park School. And they're also going to build a bunch of housing around here as well. All of the street names in this development are named after different species of deer. Uh, because the whole area is called Deer Park. Because deer used to run on these fields, but the deer can't come here anymore. So <laughs> it kind of feels like adding insult to injury, really, when you... You know, I know development has to happen, progress has to take place and so on, but you take a place where deer used to run freely, build on it and then call it Deer Park. It just seems like, it just seems like salt in the wound, really. Anyway, we used to walk across this field. In fact, where we're walking right now, you used to be able to walk across this field. It was always a bit marshy here. And we often used to have to come here, even in the driest part of summer, wearing boots. And you can see, they've put this big drainage ditch here. Uh, the water table, I mean, that is basically the level of the water table under the soil here, because this is quite low-lying, flat ground, quite poor draining, it's clay soil, quite slow draining. And so the water table level is about where you're looking at now. I wonder what it's gonna be like for the houses they build on this land. I, I imagine they might well have some problems with shifting foundations over time because it's a it's one of these shrinking clay soils but anyway we'll keep looking around and so yeah over there on the other side of the road you can see there's another big ditch and they've had to dig these big ditches to manage the surface water and I mean, that's where the water wants to be, at that level in the soil. Meanwhile, over there, they're building a tunnel. I wonder what that's gonna be like when it's finished. I suspect that might well need pumps to maintain it. No comment. What's interesting here is this little compound here, all of this big heap here is topsoil that they took off one of the fields over the further. And you can see if you look down here, I don't know if you'll be able to see that through those bars, but all the way along the inside of this fence line, there are deer tracks and they go back and forth along this front line. So what's happened at some point is they've managed to trap some deer inside this perimeter fence. And all the deer could think to do was run back and forth along this fence line trying to get out. Eva! Which is kind of sad. And we quite often used to see deer in these fields over here. We don't see them anymore because it's all interrupted with temporary fencing and construction works going on. And yeah, so you can really see here, I don't know, you can probably actually make out the individual deer tracks in amongst all of that lot there but they've obviously trodden it down a lot so they've obviously been trampling back and forth here presumably trying to get the other side of the wire Eva bye bye them and in this field here this is the one where I picked goosefoot for making that fake water leaf soup that I made a couple of years ago and it's all just been churned up. Now what they did here is they, they created a couple of ponds and these ponds were supposed to be for all of the surface water that came off of the, the building work sites 
And so there was a huge pond there, which because of all the rain we had in the winter, filled up and overflowed and wasn't sufficient for the drainage they needed on this site. So they built this other kind of weird raised pond here and that also wasn't sufficient. And so the solution that they chose was, well, I'll show you. Now, bearing in mind, this is not just water that falls on the ground. This is water that's contaminated with potentially diesel and hydraulic oil and all sorts of things, contaminants from the construction site. So they had a big pond over there that was supposed to collect it and let it drain away naturally and sort of concentrate any potential contamination for remediation. But that didn't work. That overflowed because of all the rain we had. So the solution appears to have been just pump it in the river. Just pump it into the river, that'll be fine. Let nature take care of it. So that's what's happening now. The ponds have been drained into the watercourse here. This used to be a little brook. Eventually it, it feeds into the river Hamble down the way. And now it's just a oily, silty mess. I did contact the environment agency and report this because it just doesn't seem right to me but I haven't heard anything back and I don't think anything's actually happened. The other thing is that they appear to be cutting down all the trees along here. I don't think there's any actual construction going on here, but they've cut down all of the trees along this hedge line here. Now there's something kind of a bit weird about how, what happened up this bit of road here, which is currently reduced to one lane because it's being widened on the other side. On the other side of this fencing here, there used to be trees, very much like there are on this side here. So there was a steep bank embankment. This is a built up embankment to go over a railway bridge just at the top here. And there were trees on both sides. The trees on the right hand side of this road here were not meant to be cut down. They actually did a whoopsie and cut down more trees than they were supposed to. What happened after that is that the construction was halted while there was an investigation and then there were two parts of the plan originally one that could be built if the, if the trees could be cut down and the alternative which was what was supposed to be built if the trees couldn't be cut down so as i say yeah there were two plans there was plan a which was plan a is what, what we can build if we can cut down all of the trees and plan b was what we can build if we can't cut down all the trees and they were supposed to be going with plan b except whoopsie they cut down all the trees by accident um, got into a little bit of trouble about that which blew over and now that the trees are gone they're building plan a they're building the plan that has the trees out of the way and again look down there you can just see, see how much water there is that's the natural water level under the soil here that's where the water level wants to be this is essentially a swamp so they're trying to build housing and a school and a tunnel in a swamp. I'm not a civil engineer so perhaps there's something I don't know. It seems quite likely there's something I don't know but we'll see how well that works out. In fact the school is already open. Deer Park school is already open and the first week it opened it flooded. And this is where the link road from the bypass is going to come through and it's going to cross over here and then go across over that way to join and bypass the village altogether. And again, a whole mature hedgerow cut down here. I know that's probably necessary just for the junction they're gonna build and the access and all that kind of thing. I'm sure that was in the plans that we were all duly consulted on and so on, um, but there it is. So short version of that is, I don't know, the future for my little oak saplings seems like it might be slightly at risk. And that's just the chance I suppose I took but there's supposed to be all kinds of landscaping and remediation and wildlife planting and things happening after this is all completed. Well, I guess we'll see how effective that is. A while ago, in one of my budget challenges, I made a flan, a bit like a quiche, and instead of eggs in the filling, I used Bombay mix mixed with water and cooked, and that seemed to come out more or less okay. Within the constraints of that challenge, the ingredients were rather limited. So I thought I might revisit that today and see if I can actually make a kind of almost like a proper quiche 
but using Bombay mix as the filling instead of egg custard. So the filling of this quiche is not going to be baked at all. It's going to be put into an assembled baked case. So the first thing I need to do is make a pastry case. I've got 140 grams of flour there, half of which is wholemeal and half is just regular plain flour. And I'm going to cheat and make it in the food processor. So all of the flour goes in there. Actually, we we'll just have a little bit of that flour back into this dish so that the fat, when I measure it, doesn't stick to the bowl. And then I'm going to have 50 grams of, this is a vegetable fat spread, because I'm going to try and make this completely plant-based. So that's going to go into the food processor too. And because why not, a few leaves of infinite basil, because I seem to have basil all the time now. That's the fat and flour combined, and we can see it starting to form a sort of crumb-like texture there. Now I'm going to just add in a tiny splash of cold water as it's going round and I'm going to watch it forming a dough. There we go. And that only needed, I don't know, that was about two tablespoons of water to make that come together into a dough like that. Now ideally you'd chill that down, but I'm going to take a chance and roll it out while it's just fresh out of the food processor. It might be a little bit delicate. Just gonna make sure it's well floured on both sides of this ball of dough. And I'm rolling out for this dish. So this is gonna roll out to, I guess, probably this mark here. Just gonna gently roll that out. Rolling in all different directions to keep it nice and round and even. I reckon we're there. Let's just have a, just offer that up. That looks like it's going to be about right. Maybe a tiny bit bigger, because I do want to just fold this over, because we've got to bake it completely blind with no filling, and I don't want it to collapse inwards. So my flan case, I'm just going to put a bit of vegetable oil in there and make sure that's well coated. And then normally I would use semolina at this stage, but I'm actually going to use ground almonds. So I've got some ground almonds here. And I'm just going to knock that all the way around like that, just to help coat the inside of this dish. This will help the pastry to release once it's baked. Floured rolling pin so we don't stick to anything. In fact, we'll flour the whole of the top of that. Carefully roll that up. And there we go. And then I'm just going to lift up the edges. I'm not going to push them, I don't push them down. We just lift them up and let them fall into place. Maybe with a little bit of encouragement. But I'm not stretching this dough at all here. I'm just letting it fall. And I'm going to fold over this pastry over the edge. And the reason for that is I've got to bake this blind. I don't have any baking beans to stop it from shrinking away or falling out of the case. So I'm going to rely on this pastry kind of gripping the edge of the container a little bit. A bit much overhanging there. I don't want it to pull. Okay. That bit there I will just put, wrap up and save because if this breaks or splits or anything like that, I can patch it up with that and then put it back in the oven and that will help it to not leak when I put the filling in there. I'm going to chill that in the fridge now for half an hour before we bake it. Probably done this a dozen times before on the channel, but we're going to fire roast a red pepper. Whoops, that was not intentional. Okay, let's try try that again. Oh, well, whatever. I'll just do it this way. And I'm going to use my, this is a blowtorch intended for plumbing, but it would just fine. And I'm just going to burn this pepper all over to remove the skin. Okay, that is sufficiently charred now, and that might look like it's a disaster, and it looks like it's on fire. That's actually steam that's coming out of the middle of the pepper there. And all that's happened here is we've charred the skin. I'm now just going to plonk that in a plastic bag, seal it up, and leave it like that for 10-15 minutes, and the steam will soften all of that charred skin, and then it'll just scrape off. Next, mushrooms. I've got these chestnut mushrooms. Very nice and clean. They just need the tiniest little wipe over with a kitchen paper towel. If you want to wash your mushrooms, then go ahead and do that. 
I don't generally feel the need to wash mushrooms and I find it makes them slippery and awkward to handle when I'm slicing them so I don't bother. I tend to think that if mushrooms need washing they're too far gone for me to eat them. Maybe I'm a bit of a mushroom snob but there you go. I will just lose the bottom end of the stalks but not much. Uh, two, four, six, I think eight, that'll do. Yeah, because I'm going to put other things in there as well. And then these mushrooms I'm just going to slice up into nice, I don't know what, four or five millimeter slices. Now, mushrooms in a quiche can go really soggy. And that's usually an indication that you haven't cooked them long enough before you put them in. But, so what I'm going to do with these is fry them until all the moisture comes out and until they start sizzling again which means there's no more liquid to come out of them okay I think we'll use olive oil for this because I'm only going to cook these gently and it will add some flavor so I'm just going to let those sizzle away and give them a little stir from time to time while those mushrooms are cooking away let's see what's happened to this pepper so while it's been sat in the bag you can see the skin's gone kind of glossy there and all we'll find now is that that burnt skin just easily scrapes off with the side of a knife now. Now I'm not going to be too fastidious in removing it because even though it looks like charcoal this burnt skin is actually it's got a really lovely smoky flavour and I'm not going to wash this because I, obviously I don't want to make it all soggy and wet. We're not baking this quiche it's going to be assembled just from the ingredients with the sauce which will set. That's the theory anyway. We'll just lose that little bit of pith there because I think sometimes that's a bit bitter. And then these pepper pieces I'm just going to slice up into nice little strips like that. And I think these are going to go on the top of my quiche to decorate it. My oven is preheating, that's the thrumming noise you can probably hear in the background. Now these mushrooms, I've got to turn them down now because if we're not careful they will start to burn. You can see they're starting to brown a little bit there and that's good, that's what I want. I do want to have a little bit of crispy caramelization on them, but I don't want them burnt. So I've just got to keep going on that. I'm going to set those mushrooms aside and cook something else in this pan. Okay, the oven is up to temperature now, so I'm just going to prick this flan case, this pastry case, all over the bottom, just so that any steam can get out of there and that doesn't just puff up massively. And I'm going to put it on this tray so I don't have to handle it by that dish and break off the pastry once it's baked. So that's going to go in the oven for about 25 minutes. And then into this pan that had the mushrooms in it, which is still slightly on the heat, I've got about 125 grams, so like two big handfuls of spinach, which I've just rinsed and it's still slightly wet, but that's not a problem. When we put it into this pan, it's going to steam in that residual water and cook right down. And then I'm going to let that steam and wilt down and then I'll keep on cooking it until it kind of dries out a bit again. It will also be picking up some of the flavour of those mushrooms that was kind of baked onto the pan, so we won't be wasting that flavour. But you can see already that's wilting down, but also there's liquid coming out of it, so we need to cook that until we can't see any more liquid. Now if I was just serving that as a side vegetable, that would be fully cooked, but I do need to drive off this moisture. Okay, moisture content has gone down a fair bit now. I think there is still, yeah, there's still quite a bit of liquid in there but I'm going to stop cooking now because I don't want to overcook this spinach. So what I'm going to do with this spinach, just to get it down to the required moisture content, is firstly, ouch, too hot. I'm going to wait a little while, but I'm going to squeeze that out. And you can see liquid will come out of that. Yeah, too hot to squeeze at the moment, so I'm just going to let that cool off a bit more, and then we'll do that again. But it is kind of amazing how that big colander of spinach cooked down to just one little handful like that, isn't it? Okay, total cooking time of half an hour, and I think that's good. Yeah, we're gonna stop there. Now, it has pulled away a little bit from the edges there. I'm just gonna pretend that didn't happen. Everything we need to fill this quiche is right in front of us here. So we've got the cooked spinach and mushrooms. We've got the prepared flame roasted pepper. I got my Bombay mix, and I've got some oat milk. So this is unsweetened barista style oat milk. And I think these barista style plant milks typically you can, they're designed to be able to be heated up and also they're typically unsweetened. This is unsweetened. Now you might be wondering where's the seasoning in all of this and it's here. 
because Bombay mix, if I can just read the ingredients, Bombay mix is noodles made of gram flour, maize flour, potato starch, vegetable oil, salt, chilies, caraway seeds, cumin seeds, peanuts, lentils, chickpeas, vegetable oil, and then there's salt and spices as well. So there's salt and spices in the noodles, and then there's salt and spices on the noodles as well. When I cooked with this before, I was able to just make a soup out of this, and it didn't need any additional seasoning. It was actually quite salty. I'm hoping that as a filling, this will combine really nicely with these vegetables and this oat milk, which is unsweet and unseasoned, and that I won't actually need any additional seasoning. I might add a bit of salt and pepper at the table if I feel it needs it, but I suspect it probably won't. So I've got 400 ml of my oat milk. I'm just gonna let that warm up ever so gently. And I've got 80 grams of Bombay mix. And that's including the peanuts and the lentils and all the other seeds and bits and pieces. And while we're waiting for that to just warm through, I'm going to try a bit of this oat milk. Yeah, that's quite nice actually. Yeah, I would have that on my cereal. Now, because it's still the middle of January, we are rapidly losing the light now, so the, the lighting conditions in this video are about to change and probably become a bit unpleasant and weird. I'm going to let that warm through, let the milk heat up, and let the Bombay mix soften, and then we'll blend it and then bring it to a boil to thicken it. I will just decant into the proper container for the stick blender. Just going to taste that for seasoning. Yeah, that's good. So that's the blended Bombay mix. Quite spicy, actually. And that's going to go back into the pan. And I'm going to bring that to a simmer, which will explode all the little starch grains and make it thicken up even more. And for this, I am going to need to stir it constantly because otherwise it will just burn on the bottom of the pan. Just for a nice healthy colour, a tiny little pinch of turmeric. And just because turmeric can sometimes be a bit kind of lurid yellow, I'm going to go for about a quarter of a teaspoonful of sweet paprika. I don't know what that's going to look like on the camera at the moment. We're under artificial lighting, so all bets are off, really. I can feel it thickening now. Camera wasn't rolling for that first bit. Oh, I think I might have got it on the other angle. So we've got in there some filling, some mushrooms, some more filling. And now I'm just gonna give this, this spinach another little squeeze. And then I'm just gonna break that up and scatter it over the top like this. Again, trying to create a layer. And now all of the rest of this filling is gonna go on top. And you can see it's thickening and setting already. But that's fine, that's what we want. Could have made a little bit more filling in there and maybe piled a bit, but I think that'll be fine. And then I'm just going to arrange some of these pepper pieces artfully, he says, on top. Well, not the prettiest thing in the world, but I think that might have worked. All right, it's the following day and it's time to give this a taste. And I think I've got to say, I think we've got to treat this as version one. I'm not tremendously happy with the appearance of this. It just looks a little bit sad and flat. I think it probably could have stood to have about half as much filling in there again as it's got. But anyway, let's run with what we've got. It kind of looks all right inside, but I suppose what's most important is what does it taste like? Hmm, pretty good. It's interesting, this filling, this filling is less egg-like the day after than it was when it was first set. I think leaving it overnight might have been a mistake. Anyway, it's still, I would say, a pretty decent substitute for quiche. I think we need to do some more work on this. I think it's a viable idea. I've definitely overbaked that crust, it's tough. I think I should have chopped up the spinach. It's a little bit kind of stringy in there. So yeah, as a substitute for quiche in a meal like this with a bit of salad, I think that actually works okay. It definitely tastes better than it looks. I think I need to do some more work on the appearance, but using that Bombay mix with oat milk as a substitute for egg in a savory flan or quiche works just fine. I'm quite happy with the combination of those other flavors as well, the red pepper, the mushrooms, and the spinach. So yeah, note to self, thinner and more delicate crust next time. This is what happens when I make short crust. Perhaps I should get Jenny to make it for me next time. But yeah, I like that. And there's a good bit of spiciness from that Bombay mix. And blending it all up there with the oat milk has really brought the spices right out. So yeah, happy-ish with this. I think we need to work on version two though. Oh, you're such a good girl. 
Okay, well, who likes surprises? I know I do. And I've ordered this. This is a kind of mystery box from Photobox, although actually it says Borough Box on it. Photobox appears to be a kind of online gourmet and artisanal foodstuffs store. Not really quite sure how to describe it, but I noticed that they had mystery boxes. So I ordered one of the mystery boxes. There's an upgrade option to upgrade to £19 instead of £9.99, and you get twice as much. So this is my £20 box from Photobox. Now I have absolutely no idea what's inside of here, except that it could be things that are near to, near to expiry date, possibly damaged packaging, or maybe things that just don't sell all that well. Supposedly I've got twice as much recommended retail price in here for the money I've spent. So we've got a bunch of shredded cardboard packaging, and then, oh I see, so we've got, <laughs> we've got two, boxes inside. I hope it doesn't mean I've got two identical boxes here. That would be a bit of a disappointment. I was hoping that doubling up would be doubling the variety. Let's have a look and see. Okay, well, the first box. Let's have a look and see what we got in it. So, packet of crisps, sea salt and aspal cider vinegar, hand-cooked potato crisps, Lucy's light and tangy French dressing. Oh, by the way, this is the vegetarian box. It's not vegan but it's the veggie box. So we might find things in here that contain dairy or honey or something like that, but we shouldn't find anything in here containing meat. Prodigy, eat no evil, dark chocolate and sea salt. Plastic free, this is, oh, it's interesting, that says plastic free. So presumably this is some kind of bio plastic wrapping. I presume this is like an energy bar type of cereal bar thing. Double Dutch cucumber and watermelon premium mixer. That's going to be interesting because I don't like the flavour of cucumber. Something happened to my sense of taste about 18 months ago and I can't stand cucumber anymore. Pearls, artisan de chocolat. So these are little cocoa pearls. It's a very nice little box. I wonder if they're good. Freddy's Farm fruit shapes, raspberry. Uh, so 100% real fruit and veg. So these are like uh, these are like those fruit winders, but presumably just cut into little shapes. Salted almond and dark chocolate. Two bars of that. Quite little bars, actually. 20 gram bars in a little cardboard box. Ico Feel Good Energy. I don't know how to pronounce that. Is that yerba mate, herba mate, herba mate? Don't know. With lime juice and agave syrup. Better kind of buzz. Okay. Drinks, biscuits, T parmesan toasted pine nuts and basil. <laughs> that could be another problem actually because I think I'm allergic to pine nuts. Squirrel Sisters peanut raspberry natural protein bar times two. So there's two little protein bars in there and we got two packs of that. And sweet pea pantry playful pizza dough mix. Starring chia and flax. So this is a uh, a pack of pizza dough, basically flour, <laughs> flour, probably with the yeast already added in. Ingredients: stone ground, strong wholemeal flour, strong white flour, chia seeds, flax seeds, yeast, oregano, salt. So yeah, it's just a box of pizza mix. So that's box number one, and that's supposedly ten quid's worth of bargains. Uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose, but anyway, we'll taste a few of these things at the end of the video. Let's have a look in the second box. I'm hoping, I'm hoping the second box is not going to be just a carbon copy of the first. Oh, it's exactly the same. That wasn't worth doubling up, as far as I'm concerned, because I was only really after the novelty of unboxing and encountering different things and what we've got is another box that's uh, okay it's exactly yeah it's exactly the same I'm not gonna bother to take everything out of there so we've got two boxes of the same stuff so I'll probably pack this up and give it to somebody and we'll taste a few other things out of the other one well that is a bit of a disappointment really I don't know if I just misread the website but I thought that doubling up would double up the kind of selection anyway I'm not going to open and try all of these things because that would be rather wasteful. But I am going to open up Squirrel Sisters Peanut and Raspberry Natural Protein Bars. 
let's have a look at these. So, a little cardboard tray. Ingredients for these are roasted peanuts, dates, sultanas, sunflower seeds, raspberry juice concentrate, vegetable glycerine. Oh, that's it. Um, I presume glycerine is like for binding or for glazing them. Well, it's one of those things you have to chew for a bit before you actually really start to enjoy it. Hashtag treat your health. Yeah, first, first few little chews of that are a bit like sawdust. But as you go on, it does actually develop some flavour and becomes a bit more interesting. What else are we going to taste? I am going to open Freddy's Farm Fruit Shapes Raspberry. Ingredients on these are just apple, raspberry, beetroot, carrot and spinach. I think. Yeah, it's just made from fruit and vegetables. Yeah, and it kind of looks... Oh, I thought it was going to be like little, little gummy shapes. It's not. It's just like chunks of stuff. What does it taste like there? Mm. You can taste the beetroot. Kind of quite earthy. Yeah, it's okay. Nine months plus, so presumably intended for kids' lunch boxes and snacks and so on. Yeah, it's all right. Not very sweet, but that's probably a good thing. Yeah, it tastes apple, raspberry, beetroot, carrot and spinach. If you blended those things up, that's what it tastes like. Kind of not surprising. Okay, what are we going to do? Salted almond, dark chocolate or this rather posh looking box of pearls? I think this one. Seriously, what's the point of having a bow there if you're going to tie a double knot? Okay, you can tell it's expensive because it's got a magnet. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> there's only four of them in there. Is that really? Is, is that really? Are there four or eight of them? I think there's eight of them in there. Okay, well, come on. Not all that easy to get out, but there we go. They are, they do look like pearls. Okay. Strange. So a chocolate shell, the other one was a white chocolate shell with kind of chocolate ganache inside. And that's a very dark chocolate with again, ganache in the inside. Hmm. I dread to think how much that must have cost when it was new. But, oh, 11th of January, 2022. So we are just a couple of days out of date as I eat these, but I'm sure that will be fine. Well, yeah, they're all right. They're not that great though, actually. I would say they are more about looks than flavor. They, I've, I've eaten nicer truffles and chocolates than that before. These don't have a massive cocoa hit. It's basically chocolates presented as if they are jewellery. And I might open this. It's nice and cold, because I think this box has been in the back of the van. So cucumber and watermelon. I wonder if it's supposed to be a mixer, but I'm just gonna taste it as is. Uh, ingredients are carbonated water, sugar, natural flavoring, citric acid, antioxidant, ascorbic acid. But as I say, not sure whether I'm gonna like this because cucumbers are strange to me. I used to like cucumbers for nearly my whole life and then about 18 months ago something happened and they taste like library books now to me so uh, I don't know if this is going to be the same. I can smell the watermelon probably more than the cucumber even though the two smells are quite similar. Nope. No, I don't think so. Yeah, just about tolerable. But that's my fault, not this drink. It's probably quite nice, but I'm not enjoying it because cucumbers. But there you go. That's what a photo box mystery box looks like. I hope that's been interesting. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.